I had a lot of thoughts going through my head while those words were being sung. I love the choir song, Freely, Freely. It made me think of Ephesians 2, 8, 8 through 10. And it says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, freely. Freely we've received. Not a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's so much truth that's sung in those old hymns. So much encouragement, so much... Man, it's just, it's discipled us over the years. It's been our song of praise and worship, amen? Let me pray as we get started. Lord God, <clears throat> freely, freely we have received. And it is by your grace it's the gift that you gave us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you. <clears throat> Lead this time. Give me a voice to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. So I know there's not a sermon title in the bulletin, but uh, I put it up on Dale's sheet up there so he could make these CDs that we've continued to make. And I, I just put a title on it really this morning of A Good Night's Rest. And maybe that's just the question I'd ask is, uh, did you have a good night's rest last night? Ever have one of those nights where you did not have a good night's rest? In this psalm of David, uh, he's speaking to, to the choir master, to all, all of us, and it's an agricultural community so they can understand what a sleepless night might look like when you're not sure if the hay is going to dry And they would celebrate at the harvest when all the crops were in the barn. And it doesn't matter, right, what the corner beans look like in June or July. It doesn't matter till they're in the barn. And there is a big celebration when they're in there. But there's a lot of stress before that, right? And I'm sure Dick or any farmer here could say maybe they've had a few sleepless nights or maybe even last night with a forecast of rain these next couple days they saw hey i see from 2 to 4 a.m there's a chance of rain and they went to sleep hoping they went in bed before falling asleep hoping that they were going to hear that pitter patter of rain at 2 a.m and some of us go to lay down in our bed at night and we can't sleep. We're hoping for things and some of those things we can't control. Or we've had circumstances in our life that are just tough. They're painful, they're aggravating. And you can count sheep all night long. You can even sit in your bed and say, well, if I get asleep right now, I'll still get seven hours of sleep. And then an hour later, well, if I fall asleep right now, I'll still get six hours of sleep, right? We do things like this. God promises a good night's rest when we rest in him. And that's what I think this psalm is telling us. It's a prayer. It's a prayer to God. 
So if you want to open up your Bible to Psalm 4, we're going to go through it. I'm going to try to go through it just kind of verse by verse. Answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. And I'll just say this right from the start is there's a confidence, there's a boldness in how this psalm starts. Can you imagine going before the God of the universe and just say, answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness? It's kind of like what Donna just said when she was praying for that hay to dry. Oh God, let the sun shine, let the wind blow. It's almost a demand, right? But you get into the next part of verse 1 and you see it. You have given me relief when I was in dis- distress. You have been faithful before. And I know you can be faithful again and I'm expecting you to be faithful again. There's a boldness and confidence when we walk with the Lord. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. There might be a boldness and a confidence, but there is humility in the way that we pray to the Lord and the way that David is crying out to the Lord here. Verse 2, and and this is kind of the words of lament. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? How many times have we said that? When we see people, friends, whether they're in our community or they're leaders that are saying vain words and seeking after lies. David knew these things really well. Really well. He didn't have an easy road before he became king, and he didn't necessarily have an easy road after that as well. Verse 3, But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Again, there's that confidence in his prayer to the Lord. And it says that the Lord has set apart the godly, the faithful, the saints for himself. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are set apart for his good works that he has for us. I'm going to keep moving along because I'm going to spend more time at the end here, but it says, be angry and do not sin. And these are words we kind of wrestle with, right? But maybe I'll just say this simply, like never let your emotions get the best of you. Never act out of anger. Because it's when we begin to lash out where we decide that we're going to get revenge is when we sin. I think there's a difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. Without getting into this too deeply, anything that is against the will of God should give us some kind of righteous anger. Anything that is a part of God's plan and purpose, anything that is against His truth should stir up something inside us that causes us to righteously act for his name. But unrighteous anger is earthly and it's usually against a brother or sister. Usually usually against a child that he created in his image, whether saved or not. And we're clearly told by Jesus to not have hatred in our heart because it's the same as killing, right? Right? In your anger, do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. 
And I love this picture of pondering in your own hearts on your beds and being silent. No cell phone in front of you. No TV on the wall. No whatever distraction that might be in front of you. But laying on your bed, pondering in your own heart and just being silent. It's easy when someone wrongs you to desire revenge. But David encourages the faithful believer to keep his or her worship and trust in the Lord. Verse 5 says, Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. We trust and we obey, right? Just another good truth that was sung in those songs. We trust. Then we get to verse 6. It says, there are many who say, who will show us some good? David hears the voices of those that are cynical toward God and towards his promises. He hears these voices that are saying, who will show us some good? And we hear these voices as well, these voices of continual disappointment from man. And we hear these voices over and over again and we begin to doubt or others doubt if God will ever show us any good again. But when we start focusing on circumstances, when we just focus on whether the hay is going to dry, We put our head down and we fix our eyes on what is seen and not what is unseen, not what is eternal. And some of us will just say, it's too tough, it's not right, it's not fair, where's God at? I've been in this place all the time and I know many of you have or you know people that are always in this place who will show us some good. And David makes a statement at the end of verse 6. Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. David says, just to see your face, God, will make everything better. He claims it He knows it in his mind, in his heart, and in his soul. Lord, you will show me what is good. And he really echoes the promise in Numbers 6, where the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to him, and you guys know these verses, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Just to see your face, God, it's going to make everything better. Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. Verse 7, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. We need to focus on the face of God and you will have joy. Who puts the exceeding joy into David's heart? Who puts gladness in David's heart? God did 
And it says it's more than when grain and wine abound. And again, I just said it's an agricultural community, and they get this. There's a celebration at the harvest. There's grain and there's grapes. They're harvested. We get this. It's a celebration. There's joy. He doesn't disregard the blessings here on earth. And sometimes we even discount the blessings that are right in front of us. We even forget the little things that God does to bless us each and every day. And some of you are at a place that you don't even think so. I've had conversations with people and it's like, nope. I'm not blessed. God doesn't, God doesn't work in that way. And I could give example of an example that would just show that God does bless us and there's blessings right in front of us. I think he does not, David does not disregard those blessings. If you woke up with a roof over your head, you're blessed. If you woke up with a job, you're blessed. And some of you would say, you'll just whine about your boss and how crappy he or she may be. And others are saying, man, I wish I had that job. Like, you're blessed. If you're like me and you had money for Lucky Charms for breakfast today, so Summer and I could have a breakfast date, like, man, we're blessed. If you got out of bed unassisted today, like, you're blessed. If you're able to drive to church today or get a ride with somebody and make it here safely, like, you are blessed. Like, we look past these tiny blessings all the time. I catch myself complaining lately about our van. I love to have brand new, brand new Buick Enclave or... A nice new Toyota Sienna. They're all hybrids now, so they get great fuel mileage. And I like to whine because my van's AC is leaking and terrible, and so every two weeks, Ashley will say, it's getting hot in here again. <laughs> or we drive down the road, and the seals on the side aren't quite right, and so we get dust inside, and you start coughing, and it's like, oh, I've got to turn the AC or the air a certain way so it doesn't suck in more dust, and like, There's rust on the side now and the sliding doors. They had to cut one of the lines because it quit working mechanically. Like, man, I can whine all day, right? And then I can go places and I see, oh, <laughs> look at the car that they drive. They would be so blessed to be in the spot that I am. It's pretty easy when you start putting things in perspective to see that you are way more blessed than you can ever imagine here. The problem is those things are temporary. When you start fixing your eyes on things of this earth, we are often disappointed. Our happiness just goes up and down like a roller coaster. So he doesn't disregard when grain and wine abound, but he says, you have put more joy in my heart you alone, God, have put the joy in my heart. Because what happens when grain and wine do not abound? What happens when you lose your job, get into a health crisis, lose your spouse, wreck your car, don't get a rain, don't have milk for breakfast even? Whether it is your own fault or you've had no choice in the decision or outcome, there's only one joy that is eternal. And David is saying, unless we focus on the face of God, we will not have joy in our heart, true joy. Amen? I want to give one example, and it's from Matthew 14. You can turn there if you want. It's going to be up on the screens as well. 
Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. It says immediately he made the disciples, this is Jesus, get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by, his, by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Think they were getting a good night's rest? And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. There was a blessing coming, wasn't it? And sometimes we just act out of fear and we doubt that Jesus is going to help us. Help us. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And at this point in the story, all the pessimistic people here say, well, he didn't get very far. And my response is, he's gotten a lot farther than any of you have ever gotten on the water. In fact, some of you won't even wait in the water, right? Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased, ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Let me just say, a good night's rest is only by Jesus only by coming to a saving faith in him. The Bible says that the God became flesh. And he came to us and, and we get to know him personally by who, who he is by looking into the infallible, trustworthy word of God. We get to look at the face of Jesus by looking at the Son of God, God in flesh. We get to see who Jesus was, what he did, and did you need to join your life? Fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Find out who he is. Fall in love with the Savior of the world who says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Fix your eyes on him. And the promise is joy, and in verse 8, says the promise is peace. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. The disciples on that boat turned to worship out of their joy for what he had done. And it gave them ultimate peace. If you're in your Bible right now, I would circle that line both. Because some of us are blessed enough that we get to lie down in a bed at night. And for David, he understood that to even be able to lie down, even when you know that Saul or whoever is coming after you, like he got to lie down, and that brings peace in itself. But God says that in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. Some of you are lying down at night and the things of this world the things of this world are weighing on you so heavily. 
and you can't get a good night's rest. But God promises abundant joy. God promises peace. Freely he gives that. But only by the saving power of Jesus when we are in him, when we trust him fully. In peace I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safely, in safety. Amen. I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to pray that prayer of blessing because we know that God alone makes us dwell in safety. Only through Jesus can we have joy, can we have eternal life. There is one way. So I'm going to pray that prayer from number 6, 24 through 26, knowing that this is full, been, it's been fulfilled through Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. And we echo these words that you gave the, the Israelites when you said the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We thank you, God. In your name we pray this. Amen.